Hi, I'm Peter Prevos, and welcome to the screencast for Chapter 8 of Data Science for Water Utilities. In this chapter, we start working with the customer survey data we cleaned in the previous chapter. To do this, I'm opening the 08-customer-experience script. And the first step is to run the script we wrote in the previous chapter to create a clean data set of this customer survey. Okay. Now, the only parts that I'm interested in are the involvement variables. And they start with the letter P. So the next step would be to create a separate data set, which I'll call PII, which is the personal involvement inventory, which is the variable we, uh, we are analyzing here, which was developed by a scholar named Zarkovsky in the 1990s. And more about that in the book. What we're going to do is to select from the customer's data set the custom ID, because we want a unique identifier, and any item that starts with a P. So that's the starts with function from dplyr. Now, the libraries were all called within the customer clean script, so they should all be available. And there we go. Let's have a look. The PII now con consists of the custom ID and the seven items, which all have a value between one and seven, or perhaps missing. So let's look at the missing data with uh, this, that package, and we'll see there are indeed some people who didn't answer any of those questions. So the next step is to only use the complete cases. And if we run this visualization again, we have a nice clean data set with 100% of the data present. Let's look at this at this data for a moment. But before we can do this, we need to change its structure a little bit. So let's open the ggplot and the tidy libraries. And I've got my PI data set. And I would like to create a box plot that shows the distribution of each of those items. Now, if they're all in a separate column, I would have to run 10 different um, so to do that, we're pivoting it to a longer set. And we're pivoting all the columns except the custom ID. So that's P01 to P10. There's a new variable, which we call item. And the values variable, so all the numbers that are under this, these P values, excuse me, we call that response. So if I create this, I'm creating a long version of the data set where I have a custom ID. Each customer appears 10 times and their responses and so on. And now I can put that into ggplot by plotting the responses by item using a box plot. So my aesthetics are the item and the response and I'm filling the boxes with cadet blue. By the way, if you want to know what color names are available, just run the colors command and here um, all your different options. So let's go for a change to spring green one. We end one, get an idea what it looks like. And there we go. But that's a diversion. Now we can already see more or less a pattern here if you squint a little bit. Um, the answers to the questions P1 to P5 uh, seem to be all very high with outliers indicated by the dots. And the items from P6 to P10 all seem to be a little bit on the lower side. So there seems to be two different things happening in this data, but that's just a visual inspection. To really test that, we're going to look at the reliability and the validity of this data. And first, we can look at the correlation between items, because we can naively suggest that if two items go together, if they are responses to the same underlying mental state that those items correlate highly with each other and the cor function does exactly that so the correlation between two vectors pii dollar sign one and pii two is in this case 0.65 this correlation function can also create a matrix i put the whole data frame into the correlation function except for the custom id I get something like this. Now there's too many variables in here, so let's just clean that up a bit. So we get a correlation matrix from P1 to P10, 
And then just a quick visual inspection of this, we see that all the values are positive and they're all fairly high-ish. You know, the lowest is sort of 0 0.24, 0 0.23. But again, that's not, that's just a, a subjective judgment. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Maybe we can visualize this. The Gigi core plot is a, an interesting package to visualize correlation, matrix, correlation matrices. There are lots of other packages that can do this, but let's um, give Gigi core plot a go. And here is an example of what that could look like. Again, looking at this visually, we see that all the values are red, so they're all correlating positively, as we already confirmed. The diagonals are obviously are all correlating with themselves, so they're dark red. And we see here that P6 to P10 seems to be highly correlated with each other, and P, um, but not so much with P1 to P5, and P1 to P5 correlate highly with each other, but not so much to the other two. Again, a hint that there's perhaps a split in the data. No, these correlations are statistically significant. The, the core.test function, core.test, does exactly that. So I can test um, for two variables. And in this case, I'm getting a nice little output, the Pearson product moment correlation. It tells me what the data is. It does a t-test and Alternative uh, hypothesis that the correlation is not zero um, and that has a likelihood of zero, pretty much. So in other words, this correlation is statistically significant. GG core plot package can also visualize this. Now, in this case, all the, I've removed the diagonal, by the way, by, say, short.diag equals false. And I said that the insignificant value sh should be blank. Well, there are none, but let's let's for for sake of argument say that the fifth P P zero five is has no correlations with anything. Then you see we get something like this. Well, that's the correlation, and, and again we're digging a little bit deeper. We're seeing mm, there there are some correlations with each other, but Kornbach's alpha is a, a recognized value of assessing the reliability of a survey. So to, to test how strongly uh, or whether all these variables relate to, to each other, whether they have internal consistency. And to do that, we use the covariance. And I'll extend that a little bit. And to calculate the covariance, there's a formula here. We take the sum of the differences, the, of the product of the differences between the two variables and divide that by the number of samples minus one. Again, Bessel correction for non-biased sample. And so the covariance is 1.67 for P1 and P2. Easier, there's a COV covariance function, which works exactly like the correlation function. What is, what is a covariance and what is a correlation? Now, covariance is a measure that describes whether two variables are related to each other. Now, specifically, it measures whether those two variables change in the same direction or in opposite direction, so whether it's positive or negative. And covariances can be from minus infinity to positive infinity. But it doesn't tell you anything about the strength of that relationship, and that's why we have a correlation. So it's a normalized covariance that's from minus 1 to plus 1, and that indicates the strength of this relationship. And to calculate this correlation, we take the covariance and divide that by the product of the standard deviations. Or we use, as we saw before, the core function, which is a lot more convenient. And just like before, the covariance um, can also be expressed in a matrix. The reason I'm telling you this is not so much about the statistics, but also to introduce the concept of a matrix. So a matrix is like a data frame, but all the cells have exactly the same data type, in this case, numbers. When this covariance matrix, then I'm determining the number of variables, the variables in that uh, matrix, K, which is the number of columns, which happens to be 10. Then I need to take the average of the diagonal of that matrix. So you see that there are a bunch of functions within 
uh, to calculate with matrices. We can take a diagonal, for example. Um, which, uh, take a diagonal, which is which are these numbers, and then our V is the average. Uh, C is another variable, which is the average of the lower triangle of the covariance matrix. Now let's have a look what that looks like. So the lower triangle gives me a true-false matrix where the lower triangle is true. So we can filter the lower triangle, triangle out and take the mean. Then the Kronberg alpha, there's a formula for that. That's a lot of work. Uh, the psych package has very extensive uh, capabilities to analyze surveys. It also has the alpha function. And that is a list, and within that list, we need to have the total. So here's the raw alpha, 0.87. Now, without going into, into all of the theory, this is just an example on um, how to calculate the reliability of the survey. And 0.87 is a high value because a Cronbach alpha of larger than 0.7 is generally considered to be significant. So now we know that this particular survey, uh, survey, these 10 questions, have internal consistency. They are reliable. But do they actually measure something underlying? And what is the structure of that, what it measures? And to do that, we use factor analysis. And factor analysis is a method to use to identify underlying factors. So we have these 10 variables, but can we reduce that to one or two to um, to actually measure this thing called consumer involvement. And what it does, it tries to explain the variability between the observed variables, and it's a bit like a linear regression, which is in chapter nine. It's a dimension, it's a dimension reduction technique, which is um, also used to minimize uh, amounts of data, but that will be a principal component analysis. So it's very closely related to principal components, but not quite. And the idea behind factor analysis is that the observed variables, so the survey items, uh, they share a common underlying factor, which we hypothesize here to be consumer involvement. And if that's the case, they'll be highly correlated or a high covariance with, the, uh, with each other. And then they can be grouped in a factor. So how do we implement this? We need to run the psych package and the GPA rotation, that's uh, more about that in a second. And within Psych, we have the FA function, factor analysis. And we put in there the EII minus the customer index. We want two factors because theoretically, Zykowski theorized that there are two factors in this, in this variable. And we do some rotation. And I'll explain that in a second. And then we have the loadings. The loadings are like regression numbers. And what we see here that P1 and P5 all relate highly to each other, but there's some overlap into six to 10. Where it is blank, it means it's less than 0.1. And MR2, so these are theorized factors. Um, again, six to 10 relate highly to each other. And there is some overlap with, with, the, um, with the first factor. So we can say there are two factors here, but they seem to be relating to each other. Well, what does this rotation mean? Well, what I can do here is I'm running two models using the base R factor analysis function for convenience. Um, and I'll do one with zero rotation and one with, um, with oblimin rotation. There are lots of different types of rotations. And the oblomin rotation maintains correlation between the two factors. So what I can do is I can now plot. Excuse me. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Plot the outcome of the no rotation. And we see here that there are two groups, as we hypothesized, they're sort of huddled together. And what is plotted here is for each of those 10 items, factor one and factor two. So these are the scores that we saw earlier. Uh, and we can draw some lines in there as well. But draw the rotated one. We see a slightly different picture. What has happened now is that the oblomin rotation looked for the way to rotate these factors so that they 
as much as possible are close to one of the axes. So in other words, it, it reduces the amount of crossover between those two variables. And we can see that if we run the first version here without rotation, Bigger. If we run this without rotation, we see that there was a slightly bigger uh, overlap between those factors. Now in the psych package, we can also visualize this. Um, and here is a structure diagram. Now let's reset this for a moment. Pretty. A structure diagram which shows us that ML1 are P1 to P5, ML2 is P6 to P10. And it is now the task of the researcher to give ML1 and ML2 a name. Now in this case, the first one is a cognitive uh, level of involvement and ML2 would be an affective slash emotional level of involvement. More about the theory in the textbook. And, but they also correlate with each other by 0.4. There are other rotation methods which do slightly different things. Now we have confirmed that there are two dimensions within this consumer involvement, that they all strongly belong to each other. So now we can say that we have a cognitive involvement and we can add up P1 to P5. And for the affective um, involvement, so the emotional involvement, we can add up P6 to P10. Now let's do exactly that. Um, like this. So here is an, now the graph. We see the distribution of the affective scores and the distribution of the cognitive scores. And what that tells me, without going into too much detail, is that people have a lower emotional attachment to tap water as they do a cognitive uh, attachment. So in other words, we know um, that water is extremely important, but it's not a it's not a very sexy product, like, for example, a car or a new pair of jeans. So that's a quick introduction into using surveys to analyze the customer experience. In the next chapter, we're going to look at some different statistical modeling by introducing linear regression.